Hello everyone, this is Leslie Mitchell Clark of LMC Media and I am so pleased to be chatting today with Didi Vergados, who is not only a master practitioner in neuro-linguistic programming specializing in health, she is also a master hypnotist. Additionally, Didi is the founder and the director of the Bloom Center for Hypnotherapy and I believe the website for that is bloomhypnosis.com. Please do check it out. And uh, Didi holds a deep fascination with the power of the mind and she has spent the last 17 years researching on how we can actually utilize that power to achieve our goals. She specializes specifically in weight loss as she herself struggled with this issue for the first 30 years of her life. And today Didi is here to talk about emotional eating and the discoveries that she has made through her work in NLP and hypnosis. Thank you so much, Dee Dee, for joining Thank me you, today. Liz. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Now, just tell us a little bit about your history. It sounds fascinating to me and how you actually came to specialize in hypnosis for weight loss, where it became not necessarily a sensitive subject, mm -hmm. but something that you have analyzed and understood and now have transformed into a very useful um, mode of hypnotherapy. Okay. So when I first started out, I was I mean, and I still do to this day, I'll, I'll work with most conditions people come in with. Um, but I myself had a, a horrible history with weight loss. Weight loss, weight gain, weight mm -hmm. loss, weight gain. I was on what we call the diet cycle, the diet wheel, mm -hmm. going up and down and up and down. And it started all probably, I'm guessing when I was about nine years old, for some reason, I got it in my head that I was fat. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that when I looked at pictures much later on, um, when I was in my 20s, of when I was that age, I actually wasn't fat. Mm -hmm. But somebody had suggested a family member or something along the way, and somehow I got the idea in my head. Here's the crazy thing. From that time on, I remember being in grade five, I would not eat all day because every day would be a new day and a mm -hmm. diet would start. So for every single day until long after high school when I started into my first career, I did not eat until four o'clock every day. And then when I did eat, I'd eat all night long. And mm -hmm. I went, okay, I'm gonna start my diet again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, one of the defining moments I had was at some point where I just said, this isn't working. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not working. Clearly, I've tried this for <laughs> whatever it is, 10 years, it's not working. Um, and then I just decided, well, look, I guess I just have to accept the way I am. I'm going to be fat. And, you know, of course, you know, when you're the chubby girl, you don't get as many dates and things like that. So it's, it's, it was a little heartbreaking. But you know what? It was in that acceptance that it took all the pressure off. And then I found that I didn't need to eat as much. Mm. But of course, that didn't do it. Right. I still went through another 10. This is probably when I was... I'm guessing about 19 or 20. Mm -hmm. Still went through another 10 years of struggle. Took it all off, put it on, took it off, put it on. Everybody who's been through any kind of weight loss um, knows the story mm -hmm. because we go on a diet yeah. and diets do, do not work. They do not work. So um, it wasn't until my 30s when I had studied all this NLP and hypnosis and things like that where I played around with different um, modalities um, in learning how to eat intuitively with the body, figuring out what the message was I was giving myself in my mind because when people come into my office the reason I began to specialize in this is because they would come in they would sit on this couch and they would say the same thing every single time it was the same story as mm -hmm. mine and I would ask them the question well why is it that you think you overeat and most of the time it's you know from the time they get home from work all night long. Right, right. Okay? Right. And the question was always, I don't know. But you see, when I watched my thoughts, it was interesting. It didn't help me at that time because I didn't have the tools. This mm -hmm. was, again, in my early 20s. Yes. I watched the, the conversation I was having in my head as I was driving home, and it would always be like, oh, I can't wait to get home. I'm going to cook myself the most delicious dinner. And I was actually unconsciously planning to eat all night long. Yeah. So that's the interesting thing. And it was just like, what? Just what? Are you kidding me? Because the thing is, 
it wasn't making me happy while I was doing it. And anybody who's had any struggles with weight loss knows that maybe the idea of it for a moment it makes you happy, but there's terrible regret and shame afterwards. Mm -hmm. So you're not even happy when you're doing it. And it sets up a cycle of, I'm not happy when I don't eat because I'm feeling deprived. Mm -hmm. I'm not happy when I do eat because I feel like I shouldn't be eating or I'll never lose weight. So you never get to be happy no matter what. Mm -hmm. So I know that really warped mindset so very well. So one day again, after yet another lady had come and sat on my couch and told me the same story and I was, I was just, you know, finishing up with my files. It was the end of the day. It was like seven or eight in the evening and I just thought, that's it. I have to do something about this because this is so ridiculous at this point. Everybody's story is similar in so many ways. Mm -hmm. I have to make sure that I help people with this. Mm -hmm. So that's when I chose specifically to specialize in weight loss. Oh, that's wonderful. And so yeah. inspiring. So inspiring. Yeah. So what is, just so our listeners can really get a, a grasp on where these issues emanate from in mm -hmm. the core personality, tell us a little bit about what emotional eating actually is and how emotional eating impacts on the ability to either lose weight or not lose weight. Okay, great question. Emotional eating is different for everybody. Mm -hmm. It's similar in many ways because we're eating to make ourselves feel good. Yeah. But the root cause is different. So as I said, people come in, I said, because my own curiosity, I'm like, well, what is it that you think that's driving you to eat? Mm -hmm. And they'd always say, I don't know. And then we do a form of regression in hypnosis that takes them back to that feeling and where it originally came mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. And there's so many different reasons that I can cite. Some people are lonely. Some people are overwhelmed. Um, really, some really interesting cases I've had, um, a couple of them with men. One was, he said, I don't know what it is. The only time I overeat is late at night. And when we did some regression, what we discovered was he was actually an athlete and was training for the Olympics. Huh. And his coach used to say, and it made sense at the time, mm -hmm. and that's what he said. He goes, when he, we discovered the root cause of his overeating, um, the coach always said, you got to eat lots and you got to eat late at night, which made sense when you're, you know, Right. 16 or 15 yeah. years old yeah. and you're running 10 miles a day and you're running up mountains with people on your back yeah. of course that makes sense then <laughs> but the thing is that suggestion had gone right in because obviously you admire your coach yeah. you know it to be true at that time and he had never stopped and once we addressed that he never ever had a craving to eat late at night again oh, that so cool? that's an example mm -hmm. of what it can go back to a rather unusual one um, but a lot of it is just loneliness boredom overwhelm or it can be the opposite. I worked with a doctor one time and he would start overeating at four or five o'clock just when his day finished. And when we went, got to the root cause, the unconscious driver, mm -hmm. what it was was he just had too much energy and he didn't know what to do with it. So he'd eat to just like kind of, ah, because mm -hmm. that's what eating does. Mm -hmm. And eating can be looked at for people wh who it's chronic with, they do this every night of their lives, can be looked at like a food addiction mm -hmm. because brain scans do actually show us that eating high highly refined sugary carbohydrates with high salt and fat content what they call the bliss formula mm -hmm, mm -hmm. actually goes into the pleasure centers of the brain oh, yeah. called the nuclein accumbens mm -hmm. nu nucleus accumbens mm -hmm. and it acts just like cocaine or heroin mm -hmm. only a little bit slower mm -hmm. so basically we need to find out and address with hypnosis getting to the root driver what is that so loneliness overwhelm boredom what quite often i find with college students or young people they do fine when they're at home as soon as they go away and they're in university they get into this habit of overeating and with one student i remember it was like that was her way of connecting with her family because that's what they used to do right, together. Right, so right. whenever she felt lonely, she'd eat exactly the thing that her mother would give her. Mm -hmm. She was Italian, lots of bread, things mm -hmm. like that, because that was her way of feeling love when she was away. So with everybody, it, it, it's different, although it's the same principle. We're all trying to make ourselves feel good in some way, shape or form. Indeed. And from now, the medical knowledge we have, the fact that nucleotides are being produced mm -hmm. by this combination, this pleasure combination of foods right we really have the addictive aspect uh, in focus mm -hmm. now which was never before understood and did you find Didi or have you found that uh, some clients that come to you if they are 
afraid or fearful of engaging emotionally mm -hmm. with a member of the opposite sex, perhaps, uh, that they tend to create maybe a fat suit, for lack of a better term? A hundred percent. Yeah. So I've had clients, one I'm thinking of specifically, um, was she's actually a friend I did do some work with her but we had met when we were on an island in Mexico and I just watched her she was overweight and she was everybody's best friend mm -hmm. and it was so interesting with her because she never wanted to be the center of attention she was so 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 very wanting to be in the background and when she did speak she never put any out any kind of sexual energy it was like I'm gonna be the best friend of the guys mm -hmm. you know the best mm -hmm. friend that's the girlfriend right. I mean not the girlfriend but the girl the woman that's the best yeah. friend a supporting and I, player forever I, yes yeah. and I thought this is so interesting so later on you know I did some work with her for weight loss but long before the work started I said to her I said in order for you to be successful for, with this weight loss, you've got to learn to be comfortable around men. And she just, I just can't, I just can't be comfortable around them. Yeah. And I said, you're going to have to learn because she's very pretty, mm -hmm. very, very mm -hmm. pretty, blonde hair, blue eyes, nice little figure, overweight, but mm -hmm. nice little figure. And I just knew like the offers would come rolling in as soon right. as she lost the weight. Right. And I know that because that's what I experienced. I mean, I never got the offers when I was overweight, but as soon as you lose it, all of a sudden, you know, you become more popular. Mm -hmm. So I said, you're going to have to learn how to either deflect offers you don't want in a gracious way, or be able to roll with it, or just, you're, because it's going to happen. And I knew that she would hold on to that weight until she learned to gain confidence with her boundaries with men. Mm -hmm. So yes, of course. And of course, if women have had some kind of sexual trauma Indeed. as well, yeah. that's going to be a protection mechanism. Yes. Well, that makes so, a lot of sense. And it? it's just not just women, because I just right. thought of somebody else right. who, um, um, somebody who is going to be up on an up and coming podcast, who was just going through a horrible time in life, a divorce and things like that. And Again, not only was he eating to make himself feel good, I suspect at some level he was like putting up the barriers oh, yeah. as well. But we'll, uh, we'll interview him and we'll see uh, you know, how that comes into play. And so. isn't it funny, in, in hypnosis, I'm, I'm sure you have found that sometimes, uh, sometimes the obvious is, is the truth. Right. You know, sometimes it's right there being manifested in a totally direct way. Yes. And all we have to do, or all you have to do rather, is, uh -huh. is listen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, it, it is true that some people just feel empty inside yeah. and they eat to fill up that emptiness. Fill void. So a lot of it does also see, we never just work with weight loss, we work with the whole picture. Mm -hmm. It's like, what is your life purpose? Mm -hmm. What do you want for yourself? What do you want in terms of who you want to be in the world? How do you want to be in the world emotionally speaking so that you don't have to rely on food? Right. You know, we have to address all of these because it's not just one level, one thing that you're working with, do X and Y happens. It's, mm -hmm. it's the whole picture, so. Indeed, and from talking to other hypnotherapists, I have come to believe that working in weight loss is perhaps the most complex thing that you as yes. practitioners do because of this multi-leveled, multi-tiered, mm -hmm. um, whole gestalt type of situation, so. And the other thing I wanna say about that is, when you think about either cigarettes or drugs, it's on or off. You're either doing it or you're not. With food, every time you step out the door, there's that grocery market or that variety store with, with chocolatey Twinkies and candies and, and chocolate bars and things like that. So it's thrown in your face like every block that you take in life. Mm -hmm. So you know what? It, it's, it's, again, it is, you're right. You have to work on it on, in many different layers to make sure that the person um, can withstand that barrage. I mean, just yeah. go through a Walmart line. <laughs> I mean, you go through a Walmart line, the one that you have to wheel around, and every, there's chocolate bars, there's oh, yeah. chips, there's everything. Everything. There's everything. It's, it's yeah. like you're constantly being barraged. And I watch people in the line. That's a fascinating thing. I watch them in the line and they'll pick up three chocolate bars, they'll look at them and they'll put them away. Yeah. And it's not 
what they're gonna buy. It's not if they're gonna buy, it is what they're gonna buy what, at that point. Because what they will they end up buying. Inevitably, mm -hmm. are, it's so in your face when you're going through that line and you're so bored, you're just standing there that the mind starts going, yeah, I want chocolate, I want, you know? Yeah. And it's just, yeah, it's what they buy, not if. So, Indeed. So that's why food can be much more complicated. And, and of course, there's we have to address those levels. There is the level of environment. So for example, I worked with somebody and she said, I'm great. I have no cravings for food. This was after one or two sessions. Mm -hmm. She said, but my boyfriend ordered a pizza and it was there in front of me and I thought, it's there, why don't I eat it? So she clearly didn't want it. She didn't crave it or desire it, right. but it was there. So it's right. all also our environment. We have to make sure that our environment supports us. Indeed. We have to make sure that all the people at know, know at work not because there's always going to be that person at work that just loves to bring the homemade mm -hmm. cookies and it makes them feel good. That's fine. But we have to put them on notice. Hey, you know what? Yeah. I'm not going to be taking those cookies. Don't be, you know, don't be offended, right? Because we are in a food, foodie kind of culture. Yeah, indeed. Well, that's, uh, that's fascinating, Dee Dee. And do you have any kind of a formula or suggestion as to how uh, your clients or just people in general can become more aware or more conscious of what that kernel, what is actually driving the emotional eating? How can the mm -hmm. average person on the street get become in touch aware? With that? Become yeah. aware at the uh, the origin of the issue, yeah. the emotional origin. Because it's the issue. very unconscious. So what I'm going to say is, if you create a food journal. Mm -hmm. And you're so you're going to write down not only what you're eating, but how you're feeling just before mm -hmm. you made that choice. Mm -hmm. So, for example, it might be okay. It's breakfast. Oh, I'm just eating because it's time to eat. Lunch. Yeah, people do pretty good breakfast, lunch. Actually, they do pretty good dinner. It's after dinner. That's right. But there are the snackers in the car. So watch the the dialogue that's going in on in your head mm -hmm. and how you're feeling if you feel every day after work I'm overwhelmed I had worked with one woman with an addiction not a food addiction but another one and even though 90% of the time at work she was fantastic she was actually fantastic she would focus on the 10% that she did wrong and she would beat herself all the way up on her drive home to the point where she got home and she engaged in that addiction because uh -huh. she just yeah. felt so very bad. So she was self-medicating then. With at the, that point, at that yes, point. yeah. Yeah, yeah. so you've got to watch that inner dialogue and, and then when you, when you notice how you're feeling inside, label that emotion, kind of say, what is this? Is this, am I actually hungry? Mm -hmm. Am I overwhelmed? We have a, 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 an acronym we use called HALT. Mm -hmm. Hungry, angry, lonely, uh, hungry, angry, lonely, <laughs> whatever the other is. Thirsty. <laughs> I can't I remember the exact, but it's, it's halt like a stop sign. So yeah, you've got to yeah. stop and just notice what you're feeling and label that emotion. So that emotion might be overwhelm. Mm -hmm. It might be, you might actually be beating yourself up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, negative self-talk. Oh, hostile. Um, yeah, yeah, we're yeah. very hostile with ourselves. In yeah. fact, we t say things to ourselves and call ourselves names that we'd never dare call anybody else. Mm -hmm. Which brings up another story um, which reminded me of the power of this. So again, a young student, she had been overweight her whole life. And she was going to the gym, she was doing all the right things, but she'd go home and eat every night. Mm -hmm. So I made her aware of this, this self-talk when you're beating yourself up. So she was just finished her yoga class and she was standing looking in the mirror at the end and she just said to herself, oh, you're so fat. And she started down that, mm. you know, beating herself up. And uh, then she went, she remembered what I had said and she said, wait a second, I'm here, I'm at the gym, I'm doing something about it. And she said that was the first night she went home and she didn't eat all night, first oh. time in her life. Okay. So it is the self-talk, mm -hmm. it is the emotion behind it, you just want to get away from it. It's like, especially stress and overwhelm. Right. Stress and overwhelm, I just want to, I want to not think about it. With that one particular doctor, over energy. I yeah. mean, picture that. He's like, I I'd love to have over energy, it's but he just—he yeah. just didn't know what to do with it. I think he—he he felt very, it was too too much for him. So, again, kind of look look at notice what you're feeling or notice what you're saying. I remember a friend telling me a story, she just had such a bad day. She's like, I gotta get a chocolate bar. I gotta get a chocolate bar. I just gotta get a chocolate bar because the chocolate bar is gonna make me feel better, yeah. right? So just notice what's going on. If you wanna do it yourself, 
I would suggest the best thing is to go to a hypnotherapist mm -hmm. and get some sort of regression mm -hmm. to, to sort of find out where that, not only what the emotion is, what's driving it, but you know, what the affiliation is back in your childhood, what you learned, the belief you formed in yeah. your childhood, because it could be like food means love. There's so many For different most things. most people, food means love. Yeah, food yeah. means love. It means connection. Yeah. Um, I've also had people that, um, one client, her, her father was, father or mother was dying. I think it was her mother. We can't remember what parent was dying. One of them was dying, and her aunt said to her, she gave her a box of cookies, and she said, okay you can do this now it's okay to have this box of cookies because you can do this now meaning you know you're a kid you're not gonna gain weight mm -hmm. but she obviously continued that habit from the time she was 11 years old mm -hmm. so sometimes it goes back to those interesting you know beliefs that we formed mm -hmm. um, as a result of an experience so so many things let's say yes. each person <laughs> is so unique and they're so different yeah. in terms of what's causing the emotional eating but yeah if you just start to watch your mind start to become aware of the emotions and notice the way you're handling them l likely a lot of the time with food yeah just to, to, to chill yourself out or calm yourself down or put yourself into that carb coma, carb coma then you'll start to be aware of that that's the unconscious driver indeed hmm. and of course the best thing is to go see someone like yourself who yeah. can help unscramble this uh, this mystery of, mm -hmm. uh, which which does seem mysterious to the people who unfortunately are engaged in a lot of unconscious eating it's very Absolutely. rare for them I believe to be able to to narrow down what's going on I had that one glimmer once yeah that was it though yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know what the emotion was I just know that I was telling myself I can't wait to go home yeah. I can't wait to eat all night it was it, I that's when I realized I planned it into my life. Mm -hmm. But again, didn't know what the emotion, I still don't know when I think about it to this day. I don't yeah. know what it was. I think I was just overwhelmed. Yeah, well, indeed, um, I think there is some evidence to show, uh, you no doubt are aware of this, that any any level of anxiety mm -hmm. um, not only mm -hmm. would perpetuate the behavior, but anxiety itself, when adrenaline is released and mm -hmm. cortisol, it um, uh, it interferes with weight loss. Absolutely, it's part of the old engram uh, from the caveman, where you could run and run and run from the dinosaur and not waste away. Mm -hmm. So anxiety mm -hmm. interferes with weight loss. So I would imagine that Definitely. probably one of the things that you do is just chilling people out, getting right, having helping them to release everyday stress. Well, the first foundational session I do with everybody, no matter what is learning to deal with your emotions. Mm -hmm. So I teach them a process where they can come to terms with their emotions and process them. And then we create what's called choice points. Choice mm -hmm. points are, okay, your unconscious only knew one way to deal with this emotion. So now what we're gonna do is, now you know what the emotion is, you've processed it, we're gonna give you other choices. And you have to have three or more choices because mm -hmm. if you only have two, like go to the gym or read a book, what if you don't want to do either of them? Mm -hmm. Then it, mm -hmm. it goes back to eating. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we create a lot of different choice points so that you can handle that emotion differently once it's been processed and find something other to do than eat because it's we can take something out but you got to put something back right, in right right, right right we can take a behavior away yeah. by learning to resolve it but you've got to give somebody a new behavior so that's a lot of what we do as well excellent now Didi on the next podcast I know you have something fascinating planned um, uh, I do I do tell us a little you know bit about what that. because I want people to understand how it feels on the other side mm -hmm. so now now you understand my perspective of how I work with people in terms of working with emotional eating. So I'm gonna bring in a client of mine who lost 100 pounds in eight months. Um, his, his cholesterol, the bad cholesterol was dramatically reduced and his, th his hormones became balanced, his testosterone went up and he, he will speak to you about how it feels on the other side of the coin so okay. that people can un understand what it feels like to be the client, not just the hypnotist. Oh, wonderful. And I would imagine that there have been some wonderful health benefits to this massive waste weight. Oh yes. yeah, when you're, I mean, I, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I know he decreased his bad cholesterol by at least 60%. He could tell us more about that, wonderful. but, but he, we'll be speaking to Rick. 
Wonderful. Next, and you'll hear it from Rick's point of view. So stay okay. tuned. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, again, this is Leslie Mitchell-Clark of LMC Media, and we have been speaking with Didi Vergados, who is the founder and the director of the Bloom Center for Hypnotherapy, bloomhypnosis.com. And uh, certainly you can reach out to her, and she's very happy to uh, answer your questions and uh, engage with you online, and uh, you can always come see her as well. Okay. Thank you so much, Thank Didi. you, Leslie.